is a good position to be in. Okay. So um, I just want to tell you sometimes I watch, I re watch the class if I want to remind myself of something. And often it's a little humorous when hearing some people who are um, speaking and not muted. So I urge you to be careful. I want to blame this issue on Durban. I was just on the uh, conference with Hillel Noor, and I don't know, maybe that messed things up in Switzerland. So um, a few things, you know, I think as I was trying to get in, I heard um, Nahama may be stealing the show because last week she came to my rescue. I guess she thought she had to do that this week as all and already told you about one of the things I wanted uh, to mention. But I really, I really appreciate that you did that last week. And whenever you wanna take over, I'll be happy, kinda. Anyway, so I'm sure she told you that we have opportunity to have Nachas again. I saw Florence Krupat on. So we have somebody from the shul who's joining. And I guess Renan is a good place to be because Todd Sohn is also from there. And I'm so glad for Todd that his name is finally being mentioned and not just his wife, Shauna. There's another side to that uh, wonderful family. Um, Todd wrote beautifully. Please be sure to read it. I think you were given the information, Times of Israel, Todd Sohn today from his safe room. And I had just been going over Parshat Shavua before I read it. And this week's Parsha is Baalotcha. And Aaron is being given instructions to light the menorah in the Mishkan. And it says it in a certain way that you have a sense that he's told just Go to the wick, touch it gently, and let the flame rise on its own. And I had this image that certainly um, Todd had uh, a candle being lit in his family by Sheila and Gersh and um, Tznachas. It's Tznachas. Um, so that was the highlight of this week today. What else can I tell you? About 20 minutes ago, I think Shelly Wiggins WhatsApped to, I would imagine everybody that he loves, um, a sample of what's being put in mailboxes. And it's tricky. You know, sometimes you get a sample of a perfume in a little tube. And he was urging us, to know that it is not perfume, but it is poison. I don't have to say any more. Um, I'm curious, do you hear news from uh, Italy? Well, we heard about that horrible accident. Yeah, tragedy. And our prayers are with five-year-old Eitan who is waking up from the induced hardama um, anesthesia to soon find out that he has lost his brother and his parents and grandparents. So our prayers, I don't know how you handle that. I don't know how you handle that. Um, so I'll end my opening with something a bit on the lighter side. Today is um, a moment uh, in uh, the history of Bracha and Batya Feder. Why? Because Batya is, as we speak, performing in Tel Aviv. It's a week of performances from her school. It would never have occurred to me 
to choose you over her. I can't believe you did. But I have, Merle, she is performing tomorrow, Friday twice, and Saturday night. And you can be sure I and her family and friends, she has friends there tonight. But things have changed because years ago, when I would drive her to Vibe Dance Studio, where was that, Clark and Dufferin? And just, you were allowed in for the last 10 minutes of the class, and God forbid. So once I was going to be late, I parked where I shouldn't have parked and got a $100 ticket. But I would do that, because it's one of my greatest loves. Anyway, um, so yes, we are back to performing and being able to see those performances. But on the other hand, that's balanced by the attack that happened a couple of days ago. So we live constantly in this roller coaster. Um, let's begin. Actually, that is a beginning. Everything that's been said, because that's life. I hope you're all doing well. So before digressing, for a couple of weeks and focusing on Inyane Dioma, issues of the day, what was going on in this country, we were discussing the thoughts of Rav Adin Steinzaltz, and Professor Eliezer Schweitz, suggesting that leaving our routine and celebrating or commemorating a Chag, a Yom Tov, a Shabbat, is a catalyst for change and renewal. And we said that changing and even renewing is not an easy thing. And we also pointed to the irony in the reality of us making this break from our routine routinely. Every year we celebrate the same Yom Tov and every Shabbat, we celebrate Shabbat. So it's an interesting dynamic. Weekly, as we go into our topic today, weekly we, on Motzash, <laughs> Motze Shabbat, Saturday night, we say, Hamavdil ben Kodesh Lachol. We make the distinction separating between holy and the regular. The first chapter of Sefer Breshit presents a picture of creation in its entirety. It's devoted to teaching that distinctions, that's our key word today, and separations are the basis of all creation. Let's remember what we read in Breshit, the distinction between heaven and earth, light, darkness, day and night, the firmament and the seas, dry land, waters, immobile and mobile creatures and human beings and other creatures. Apparently the way of the universe rests upon distinctions. If I were to ask you as I am now, why is distinction or why are distinctions in every aspect of life important, significant? No right or wrong answer. What first comes to mind when you're thinking? We have all kinds yeah. of distinctions. Go ahead. Yeah, but it's a uniqueness, each person. Okay. Kind of uniqueness. All right, one individual is distinct from another. We'll get back to that, thank you. There's some sort of a power to contrast, to my mind, anyway. Can you say more about that? Are you saying that as an artist or? I, well, yeah, we work, on, we work on that. We look at contrasts of warm and cool and, and, and dark and light and hard edges and soft edges. And there's, all, there's a whole list of things we have to keep in mind when we look at a painting or trying to do a painting. And that, there's a strength in that. 
to my mind. Yep. Anyone else? It also it also you, in, it also indicates a change. Um, if you if you look at light and dark, or you look at day and night, or you, you look at um, mobile and immobile, from to go from one state to another, there has to be a change. Yeah, and and also uh, one would have no meaning without the other. The contrast, yeah. It would have Good, no meaning. Bad. Absolutely, absolutely. Anybody else? We're constantly changing. Everything is changing all the time. And sometimes that's good. Tell me. Can you turn? Who is that? Uh, oh, seasons what? and age. Male and female, and how opposites attract if we were all the same how boring life would be if every day was the same if every instant was the same everything is the same okay all right the same and not the same very good can you suggest a time or situation where we would consider distinguishing between a and B would be considered a negative act. I'll say that again. Can you think of a time, a situation where distinguishing between A and B would be considered a negative act? In a court of justice, if there was a different ruling, a different attitude based on the person, black or white, Jew or Arab, Muslim or Christian, male or female, if it was distinguished, old or young, that would be bad. Yeah, and in fact, the judges in the Torah receive instructions, not letting uh, influences, if they're a public figure, a private person, rich, poor, should not influence. Any other situation? As a parent, you have many children, it's very important you love them the same. If you don't love them the same, you're gonna have problems like Jacob found out when he favored his son, Joseph and all the problems that happened. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Absolutely. Any other time? In the male and female in the job structure, the females are still being, um, you know, uh, in a difficult position because they're female. There's something going on right now in Hamilton in the medical field. And uh, it, it really is a big problem. What's going on in the medical field, just quickly? Well, there's, apparently there's a woman who was head of the uh, cardiac ward in the Hamilton hospital and uh, she didn't have her contract renewed and she felt it was because she was in a situation of being the only female in that division and the males uh, didn't want to take orders from her. So who knows what the real story yeah. is, but that's it's, the fight right now. Yeah, no, no, Simone, Simone, it was five years ago. Howard Lever talked about it, it was in today's paper, but it, it, she was, she hasn't been there since 2015 or 2017. It, it, she's talking about something that happened in the past. It happened, I'm just saying it happened. Yeah, it happened. And, uh, yeah. This is the issue. Not now. Yeah, but it is an issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's lot, there's lots of there's lots of female discrimination going right. on. Right, that's the point. Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else? Almost any kind of prejudice causes you know a, any kind of a problem. So we sort of have to try and figure out how to. No, no, no. Out. But listen to my question. Obviously, prejudice is wrong. So you're saying when distinguishing indicates prejudice, it's wrong. Yes, Beth? When, okay. You'll see eventually why I'm pushing that. Okay, all right. So let's delve in. I'm going to share the screen. Oh, uh, Doris, you have to please enable me. To share. I am co-host now. 
Okay. I'm sorry, just a sec. I've got to go back out. Okay, what happened is when I went out, what I have on my screen. Hold on. I should have gone to the performance. I'm being punished. <laughs> okay. Do you see that? No. You don't see it? We uh, see our email from Doris. Yeah. Oh, join, Zoom, okay. join Zoom meeting. Class link, yeah. Second. You're making us excited to see the real text. I'm leaving the meeting. Oh. <laughs> Rafa left, she's going to come back in, so just be patient. See, we can't change the time anymore. Things happen. Listen, what happened last night on the Best Children program was much worse. Oh yeah, yeah. They couldn't. The the moderator Steven Skirka couldn't get on for fifteen minutes. They... Merle, did they record that at all? Can we access it or not? I would think that I would I would believe they recorded it. Yeah, the recording thing was on when I was watching it, and it was excellent. Like really worth watching listening to no doubt um uh, yeah if you register then you usually get the recording if not uh, i'll look I, i'll look out for it i did I'll register it but, you. I, yeah, you sh but it hasn't come through yet did, did okay. you send it though okay. i registered but i had a conflict so yeah, i no, we usually do i'll have to have a look usually take there we go okay good Rafa, I think you're on mute. You hear me now? Now we hear you, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, in Isaiah, please follow closely, and I want you to be able to tell me um, at the end what are the scenarios that we see here in very simple terms. On that day, there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a monument beside its border to the Lord. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt, for they shall cry out to the Lord because of the oppressors and he shall send them a savior and a prince and he shall save them. Okay, that's Egypt. And the Lord shall be known to the Egyptians, and the Egyptians shall know the Lord on that day. And they shall serve with a sacrifice and a meal offering, and they shall make vows to the Lord, and they shall fulfill them. And the Lord shall plague Egypt, plaguing and healing, and they shall return to the Lord, and he shall accept their prayer and heal them. On that day... There shall be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and Assyria shall come upon Egypt, and Egypt shall come upon Assyria, and Egypt shall serve with Assyria. And on that day, Israel shall be a third to Egypt and to Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the land, which the Lord of hosts blessed them, saying, Blessed is my people, Egypt, and the work of my hands, Assyria, and my heritage, 
Israel. You should have at least two different images based on these verses. What are they? Very simple. It looks like there's a coming together of all the three areas. Exactly. At first, and it spends more time on describing Egypt. Egypt, it took time till it comes to recognizing the God as opposed to its idols. And there are issues between Egypt and Assyria, but they too find a way to start working together. They had been each other's biggest competition. And sure enough, Israel is going to join them. So you have the negative picture. And then this is a description of what we are anticipating will happen in Mashiach's site, in the time of the Messiah. What would you say is the ultimate goal according to these verses? What does God have in mind? And be very specific. Peace. That each country has yeah. a different a different role. That each segment has a different responsibility. Okay. okay. Hold on to what Linda just said. Somebody else with a deeper voice said, Michael. "Peace, Michael." Okay. Yeah, peace. And it's, it's, peace. This is so clear. There's going to be peace between. The, the countries in the Middle East. Okay. Okay. Can you say that louder so everybody hears it, Michael? To me, it sounds as though there's going to. I, I was being funny, meaning that the whole world <laughs> or our enemies should hear it. But I guess it's been a few years since you've stopped teaching in a classroom, so you don't know how to shout. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Let's put Linda's comment and Michael's together because that's very important. Look at text number two. Rav Meir Soloveitchik is the grand nephew of the Soloveitchik we often have read here, Joseph Soloveitchik. And look what he says about this. Even when God makes a covenant with the entire human race, nevertheless, his love will be directed not at humanity, but at the distinct nations that humanity comprises. In other words, yes, he wants peace, but that does not mean that there will not be the distinction that Linda was suggesting. Now, an interesting narrative in the Torah, 3a. And all the earth was of one language and of uniform words. Anybody just based on that pasuk verse, what's the incident that's being discussed here? The Tower of Babel. Yes, Migdal Babel. And so it begins with people speaking one language, and doesn't that sound peaceful? So what is their crime? We know what happens. God comes down, doesn't want that tower, and doesn't want the people to have dvarim achadim, the uniform words, and he in fact spreads them out. Why? What is the problem with the scene that we see here of one language and uniform words? Anybody? Nobody, nobody was thinking for themselves. They were just following along blindly. Okay. Dvarim achadim. You see the word echad in achadim. Now, it's one thing for people to speak the same language, but the commentators overall felt that the problem was that anyone who did not conform to the way the leaders and the group 
we're thinking we're in trouble. Now there's a difference between unity and uniformity. I repeat, in no way was God looking for there to be uniformity. Even in the time of the Mashiach, and we mentioned that in the Aleinu, if you look closely at it, you'll see that isn't uh, advocating for everybody to be the same. We are meant to be the same in that we finally realize idols, they're not the thing, but one God. But it doesn't talk about worshiping God in the same way. Okay, Russell, isn't, that the, isn't that the issue with dictatorships? I mean, that's exactly well. The this is what uh, Hillel Noor of the UN Watch was just saying a little while ago. He, he gave listed different countries where the dictators kill you if you don't abide by their rules, their non humanitarian rules. And yes, that's what a dictatorship is. And there's you're not suggesting that God is a dictator. No. 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 Okay. All right. But again, it's sort of what's happening in the United States with the bull that's culture. It. That's it. That's it with the control of the media and what's what the message is going to be. It's very Orwellian. And uh, what the message is allowed to be to everybody there. It's pretty Absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely. Now. Judy Klitzner in 3B, as we continue to understand this idea of unity, peace, but distinction. She's a, an educator in Jerusalem, wrote a marvelous book that I know some of you have read. Um, Tanakh is her specialty. Since God wishes for human autonomy, any attempt to suppress the divine spark of individuality, and this refers to the nation as well, such as the collective action of the tower builders constitutes a rebellion against God. As the Mishnah states, God has stamped each individual with the imprint of Adam. And there is no one person who is identical to another. It is thus a religious imperative to maintain one singularity. Now that doesn't mean you can't be part of a group that does share behaviors and beliefs in common. Let's understand that. But there's room for your own particular take. Now, Daniel Elazar of Israel says the following, a political thinker. God's response to the Tower of Babel suggests the decisive biblical rejection of the world state as a single entity. At no point does the Bible diverge from this position and later prophecies regarding the messianic era call for a forecast what properly may be termed a world of confederation of God fearing nations federated through their common acknowledgement of God's sovereignty and dominion that they share. It is the antithesis of the world state attempted through Babel <laughs> or projected for the future as the Roman or Christian ecumeny that will unite all nations into one people. Okay, so we hopefully have a picture of what we're looking for. Again, having faith in the God, because once you start believing in idols, you're down the wrong road. On the other hand, you serve him in different ways. Now, I wanna ask you before we move on, 
If you were God, would you separate into different peoples? Would you keep different peoples, different nations distinct? That's the first question. Would you want different nations? And then once we've looked at that, what would be the way or what would you want to distinguish each nation? Okay, do you want nations? Meaning we're not all just one big universal world. And if we have nations, how should they each be distinct? Take a moment. Okay, somebody. This is Joel in Ottawa. Um, hi, I just, Joel. I just, hi. Just thinking of the ecosystems and the natural world that diversification is the way is a strength that helps uh, life survive, uh, well, thrive by uh, encouraging diversity, allows us to survive under different conditions, under different, uh, in a sense, having all one nation uh, would, would be a risk, for example. Uh, so different nations then could develop different strengths which they could trade and share. Of course, there's the downside of war or, or domination, each different nations wanting to dominate other nations. So that is a challenge. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think somebody in the beginning alluded to that, each country being able to have a strength. Anyone else? Look, there are some people who consider the global village an ideal goal, um, as opposed to being a little bit of protectionist to in order to keep your nation going. And that's quite a dichotomy that is being argued all the time, certainly in the political world. Thank you. I, I, I understand that, that the forests that the trees, which are very variegated, they all, each of the trees of a different sort help each other. They, they send water where it's necessary, they warn of bugs. There's a common way that nature has of working together despite the diversity that is represented in the natural world and I think is an example for us. Yeah. Okay, I think we're well, at the way. Joel, somebody else? Yes, I was, I, I was thinking of the, um, <clears throat> the setup of the United Nations. The idea I, was, the idea was to have peace in the world, that people will sit in a beautiful building in a forum and be able to negotiate their differences, except what has happened is you have the United Nations against Israel at the present time, which has become a bit of a farce. People who sit in on those meetings can't believe what they're hearing. So the, the idea of a League of Nations after the first war, the UN after the second war, it hasn't worked. There seems to be a problem. And there seems to be a problem with individual nations taking it upon themselves to break away from being united. You, know. <laughs> you want us, I told you this week was gonna be a little different. Do you wanna bring us back into that? Yes, we know, you're right. You're right, you're absolutely right. And this Hillel was saying, uh, we need to take a stand. Okay, anybody you know, else? Rocha, there's a difference. When you look at, if you, even if you look at Canada and you look at the United States, the United States always said it was going to be a melting pot. So everybody was gonna come in and they were going to, gonna go into this big pot and they were gonna become the same. 
Whereas in Canada, we looked at a, a country that was going to have diversity and foster diversity and that we would be able to learn from one uh, people who were living in the country, that one people living in the country would be able to learn from the other. I mean, we certainly always have growing pains, but I would rather be in a country where people can live together and, and have their own cultures and their own thoughts about their the community that they came from than live in a country where I was expected to just become just like everybody else. Yeah, it's so go ahead. Yeah, it's so uh, in my ideal world, like I think each nation should have its individuality, but there should be would be wonderful to have certain things in common, such as um, the same attitudes toward human rights and maybe in the same attitude toward the environment and, and things that were really they that like, really affect where 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 we where one country affects the other mm -hmm. um that's ever but and but yet you know we should have our own individual culture and whatever flag and language and food and other things where it doesn't matter it's fine it, it enriches each other when you can share those those different qualities or different attributes but we're missing that commonality and that's what makes me nuts I, I think it's somewhat like a family. A pre, you can have a family with diversity within the family and the family still remains a family and supports each other in commonality and common issues. So I, I think that that's something to think about. Yeah, okay, thanks. Sarah, Merle, Marlene. Now, I'm gonna take us to a place that you probably are not at all expecting. And I'm just putting forth an example of an issue um, that will help us uh, deal with this idea of distinction. Now, remember what people said, when is distinction good? When is it not? Okay. So in Vayikra, God says, I am the Lord your God, who has separated you, the Israelites, from the peoples. You shall therefore distinguish between clean beasts and unclean, and between unclean birds and clean, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I have separated you, it ends with saying, from among the nations to belong to me. And it goes on with Rav Arthur Waskow, who um, is a reconstructionist rabbi. I think he's about 88. He was first made known for coming, uh, composing the Freedom Seder Haggadah way back. And he is very involved with social action and ecology. And if everybody got a look at um, Joel from Ottawa, a recent picture uh, leads me to say that the two of them look alike with the white hair and the white beard. So now you have a picture, okay? Now, what does Wasco say? We're talking here about laws of keeping kosher. He says, what were these sharp distinctions between permitted and prohibited foods expresses and strengthens the Israelite conviction that God's creativity is expressed through distinction making. What we read earlier, heaven, earth, light, darkness, that whole chapter is about distinctions and running the world in that way. So that he's saying here that ordering, commanding, commanding that beasts and birds and insects 
go through this process of distinction making, it's following God's way. Distinctions among different orders of life and distinctions between Israelites and other peoples. Now, I put in brackets, when these laws were given, the Israelites, for the most part, were considered herders of domesticated animals, shepherds, as opposed to the Esau's who were hunters. And there was a sense, they'll go on to say, that the Israelites, he being reconstructionist, talks in these terms, that it was more the Israelites creating these rules of kashrut, that the reason is that they were at this time looking to distinguish themselves from the other people who were predators. They were hunters. Remember, when I said this before, the difference between the countries wasn't religiously, but it was the people who were worshiping idols were told were also immoral. So that's what we had against them. They might not do certain things ritually. That's not the issue. But at that time, there was a difference between the Israelites, as Avram was trying to give them that sense and his children and the other peoples. So he's suggesting this was one of the reasons to have a sense concretely that we are different from others. Let's go on. He goes on to say, Israel is not to incorporate or have contact with beings that do not honor in their motion the original separations of the world. The laws of Kashrut build into daily life constant, concrete, and incarnate reminders of the created order and its principles and of the dangers that life and especially man pose to its preservation. In these restrictions on deformation and destruction, there is celebration of creation and of its mysterious source. So there were different categories of foods. And you'll remember at first, we were meant to be vegetarian. Keep that in mind. We'll come back to that. Eating seeds and fruits does not harm the parent plants. Eating fruit and discarding the seeds does not even interfere with the next generation. And the green herbs to be eaten by the animals are constantly produced by the earth. Almost as a head produces hair. The disruptions caused by meeting necessity through eating would in the idealized case be negligible. Now this Leon Cass is a bioethicist, a physician and a doctorate. And this is taken from his book called The Hungry Soul, Eating and Perfecting of Nature through these kinds of rules. Now, he goes on Cass to say, we don't really understand what being kosher is all about. You know, we call it a chok, a law that we don't understand the meaning. It's because it was commanded, we follow it. But nowhere does it really explain why it's okay to eat a cow. I'm not saying what the rules are. I'm saying, why a cow, not a camel, carp, not catfish. And he suggests perhaps the Torah doesn't elaborate on why these little specific distinctions are made because it's not really interested in those details. It's more interested in the importance of making distinctions in life. Now, as we've said before, if you're looking and all of this is to create a better world and a better people, 
our tradition believes that we can't just think and we can't just talk, but we need to concretize these ideas. And if we began by saying that we have holidays and Shabbat to take us out of the routine, he suggests the concept of keeping kosher and paying attention to these rules is making us actually make these notions of yeah. distinctions a habit. So for instance, why don't we eat animals that hunted prey for their food and were not even permitted animals if they had been killed by predators or hunters? Why? What's the concrete value we're meant to get out of that? If I know I'm not going to, or if I know I'm gonna, even though it's always sounds crazy, if God already gave in to human beings, he saw how they needed meat, so we gave in. But the ultimate, as Rob Cook has taught us, we want to end up being vegetarians. But these distinctions, if I know that I'm eat, not eating a certain animal, and that's in the back of my head, because it was a predator, that's meant to impact on me and my behavior. Just putting forth a theory tonight and thinking of, we have a sense of sometimes a distinction might not be something we like. And you'll see what I mean in a moment. Eliezer Schweig senses that there's an issue in modern day with a tradition such as certain rituals and specifically kashrut. And he talks to this Jew who's still interested, but has a problem with that. The final stage for a modern Jew who because of his life experience and outlook finds the tradition problematic is the attempt to reconnect with the holiday as he draws the holiday's content closer to his own position within the history of his people. This is the stage in which a new Midrash is created that relates to the entire gamut of content in the tradition of the holiday. This is the stage in which the individual finds something to grasp by which he can construct an integrated picture where the long perspective is neither broken nor disappears, but expresses the experience and the thinking of this generation. So that leads us back to Arthur Waskow and him saying the questions that he asks when he thinks about kashrut, because we're all aware the laws of kashrut, certainly in the Talmudic time, did not allow for Jews to mix with non-Jews because we weren't eating what they were eating. Now, I, I will say this, that it wasn't a matter, just as interdating, wasn't a matter of feeling that the other is inferior. It's more a sense of if you want to keep your tradition alive, then there are certain things you have to do. So that's how this originally started, that we've got to maintain ourselves. So that means we can't run the danger of being with others where we might slip away our traditions. So now Waska asks, we've already said that we want to have separate nations. And I think everyone here will see and agrees that the culture and tradition of our Jewish heritage is something we all value or you wouldn't be here. 
But when it comes to kashrut, many, if not you, and it could be many of you, but I know certainly that you have children who this idea of this distinction is irrelevant, is irrelevant. Now, these are the questions that Waskow asks himself. Very significant questions for today. Questions I ask myself. In making strong distinctions about food, were the Israelites affirming that distinction making is the essence of life? For me in my own generation, no, but he's what kind? Albert. I'll call him back. Albert, can he call you back? He's doing a lecture right now. For me, in my own generation, what kind of eating would teach me to shepherd the earth instead of tearing it limb from limb? You see, he's already, even though there's some people say, keep in kosher, it's a hope, it's a law we don't understand. You can't look for outside reasons. You know, and they're all kinds. You're healthier if you eat. No, 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 no. But we tend today, and I think rightly so, to suggest that it's a tradition that can impact, if we really understand it, on behaviors. So I'm gonna say that again. In my own generation, what kind of eating would teach me to shepherd the earth instead of tearing it limb from limb? And we all have to agree, it's being torn from limb to limb. What foods would remind me that all of earth is my community, that I want to distinguish myself, asking more about from those who would treat other humans and the earth as prey. I also find myself asking more about the way I eat than what I eat. He talks a lot about fast foods and that culture rather than sitting with your family, et cetera, et cetera. Abraham Joshua Heschel, he goes on, suggested that embedded in the original warning against boiling the kid with its mother was a deep empathy for the giver, the giving, and the given of life. The you that suckled, the kid that sucked, and the milk that carried all the nourishment of life Together, they were the weave of life. To boil the child of one in the milk of the other shattered this weave. It made a mockery of mothering and thus of life. So far, so good. But then why extend, he asks, the rule to all meat, all milk? Was it perhaps because that was a way of making even broader and deeper in everyday consciousness, the necessity of distinguishing between life and death, between the milk that among mammals is preeminently the food of life and the meat that is obviously the food of death. Do we believe that the time delays between eating meat and dairy products are useful in reducing gluttony by encouraging us to make conscious choices of what, how much, and how quickly to eat. And if not, what practices do we think would best do this? Now, in response to this, I'm sure there are people who say, I don't need kashrut to do that. You know, people who are big now on certain types of diets and all kinds of exercise. So the question would be, well, what can this Jewish tradition give me that these universal exercises can't? Do these separations, finally, have the effect of strengthening our respect for life and for the nurturance that humans and other mammals share? 
because that is the ultimate question. For those of us who saying that it's a law and God commanded that that's not enough, then we have to ask these kinds of questions and find meaning in why we do the things that we do to keep kosher. Because if it's not thinking what's behind it, how do we feel about these distinctions and differences? Would we want to abandon them? Make their spelling distinctions, the badge of Jewish difference or add them to the traditional ones. So anybody want to respond to Waskow's theory about the need for distinction and doing it through kashrut? Obviously there are other ways. I'm just bringing in something that I thought was interesting and worth thinking about because certainly distinctions isn't necessarily what's going on. I'm not sure enough. Anybody? Yes. You have to unmute yourself, Ida. Okay. Go ahead. Um I think that it's a very valuable historical document because the very, to me, and not everyone will agree with me, but to me, the importance of most of what we learn from the Torah is surviving. And in the days that the Torah was written, there was no refrigeration, there was no way of uh, conserving and staying healthy, milk would go sour and so on and so forth. I, now we have refrigeration, we have freezers, we have, and I think that we have to, I always anyway, tend to put it in the context of the time when it happened and when it was decided. And that was best for the survival of people of that time. We didn't eat pork because, and so we never died from trichinosis because that's what pork was cut, filled with. We didn't get tapeworm because we didn't eat those animals. Um, people don't get tapeworm now that do eat pork because they're bred differently, they're raised differently, they're stored differently. So I think Kashrut is very, very important history lesson of how to survive different eras in our history. And I think that's why Kashrut doesn't have the same uh, intellectual just uh, pull as it used to perhaps, because we were healthy and we stayed, we stayed alive. Whereas now, uh, people can justify that, well, you know, we can, we can eat healthy and stay alive. Um, I think we have to, I, I always think of whatever we've been to, and the, the Torah was so wise because when it was written, they didn't know about trichinosis. There wasn't science the way we have it today. Uh, and it turned out Hundreds of years later, they were right. The Torah was right. It saved us. Okay, thank you. Even Anybody else? Yeah. I'm sorry? Even though we didn't know why it was saving us. Okay. With enough, with enough progress, we'd figured out that it was very good for us. Bracha, I, 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 some of my family uh, I have grandchildren who say that they are vegan or they are vegetarian and their um, way of eating requires a great deal of thought and intention and separation and it's not easy. 
But I think the argument for us continuing that kashrut could also be one argument is that to preserve us as a separate entity of Jews, we should be able to sit down at anybody else's table and say, I don't eat that way and they should respect us and that we need to do that just to define our difference. I think you used an important word in being vegan and vegetarian, you have to make conscious you're thinking about what you're eating. For sure, for sure. Anybody else? One more thing we should Michael. remember is that kashrut, these are not laws of health. Yeah. They, but they're not, they're laws of holiness. The Torah is very clear in that. If you wanna be holy, you have to eat in this way. And you know, a lot of um, experts have looked at kashrut and said, yeah, it makes a lot of sense, which I won't go into now because that's not what you're doing here. But that's what I wanna make sure that it's not a matter of health, it's outdated. It's, amount, it's, a, uh, it's about holiness, which is never outdated. Absolutely. Um, I think what you just said that we understand the way you described it at that time, it might be, you know, and we've suggested that here, that certain things no longer perhaps are for this generation. But I think I would agree uh, with Michael Lynn feeling that we're, it's not for health reasons. It's not for health reasons, but the sense of distinguishing and holding on to a tradition, which we will continue to uh, discuss in the next class, but the way he begins by saying, God, that I'm taking you and separating you from others. But on the other hand, I want you to be with others. Ultimately, that brings us back to this constant dynamic of being with others, but being different. And we have said, as you'll read, when you read, please, Todd Soans, he used the word, we don't live in a black and white. No. The opposite. In, we usually live in nuance, but the issues he's talking about in his brilliant article is black and white. Now, um, we have to believe, because this could lead us back. Somebody who's concerned with kosher. Remember months ago, I gave you an example of the butcher who was very concerned about kosher, but didn't know how to treat somebody. All of this just because you might have some people who are like that doesn't mean you throw out this tradition which is meant to impact. Anyway, okay.